Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the IDIS Fellows Final Symposium for this year. We are here with our IDIS Fellows, and each of them will be presenting their results, um, which they are very excited to. So, with further ado, you can start, Ashley. And you have to here to this one. This is the camera. Oh. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Cook and today I'm going to be talking about detecting rice as well calls in the Gulf of Mexico using passive acoustic data and deep learning. So, uh, next slide. I'm going to give a little bit of background about the species in case it's the first time you're listening to this presentation. Um, so, this project focuses on a species called the rice as well and they're uh, members of the baleen whale family and they're the only resident baleen whale that's found in the Gulf of Mexico and they're also one of the most endangered animals in the world with less than 100 individuals left in their population and they're located in an area off northwestern Florida known as the DeSoto Canyon between depths of about 100 and 400 meters in the northeast Gulf of Mexico that's shown in the image on the left over there and we know this from vessel-based surveys conducted by NOAA Southeast Fisheries Science Center from 1992 to present day. This slide just goes up to 2015. And in 2019, they were listed as an endangered species um, under the Endangered Species Act as a subpopulation of the Brutus whale. However, it was determined in 2021, just last year, that they are actually a unique species that are genetically and morphologically distinct from the Brutus whale. And since they are baleen whales, they produce a lot of low frequency, high intensity sounds that can propagate over long distances. And we can study their sounds using what's known as passive acoustic monitoring, where recording devices are placed into the ocean and you can listen to the sounds of their surrounding environments. And passive acoustic monitoring is nice because it allows greater detection ranges than the visually based methods at a fraction of the cost. And uh, it's, it's also more cost effective than having vessel based surveys as well. Um, so uh, next slide or next uh, next and um, the rice whales they have produced two broad classes of sound mm -hmm. um, and what you're looking at are spectrograms of their downstream pulse sequence. Uh, so, sorry to interrupt but we can't see the slides changing. We're, we are not seeing presentation mode. Thank you. About now? Can, can you see it now? No, uh, I mean, we could, we could see the slides, but it's not presentation mode. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a different slide. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so jumping back into you, if you click next again. Um, perfect. Um, so these are the two broad classes of calls that the rice as well produce downstream pulse sequences and long bones. Um, and these are spectrograms of their calls. So there's time on the x axis, frequency on the y axis, and the intensity of the sound is represented by the color. And if you actually click it, it should play uh, an example of the downsweep sound. Hopefully it's going to work. If not, I have an example on my phone. So I'll just plug it. So that's the downsweep pulse sequence. And these range from about 2 to 25 seconds in duration and 178 hertz in frequency. We can stop the one now. And um, the second call that they produce is our long bone calls. And these calls, as their name implies, are very long. And they range in frequency from about 150 to 110 uh, to 95 hertz. So these are the broad classes of calls that they produce. And if you change the quick again. <laughs> um, so from listening to the Gulf of Mexico, we know that rice's whales are in the, this habitat year round. 
So following the Deepwater Horizon spill, Scripps Institution of Oceanography and NOAA Southeast Fisheries have been deploying hydrophones throughout the Gulf of Mexico at five different locations. And one is in the center of the rice as well habitat. So that's what's shown in the dark blue circle in this map over here. Um, and it's called a HARP or a High Frequency Acoustic Recording Package. And looking at data from 2010 to 2018, it was determined that on about 90% of recording days, the, uh, down, the long bone falls, excuse me, were detected. And on about 31% of recording days, the downswing pulses were detected. So this shows that the animals are here year round and that this is their core habitat. And last year, passive acoustic monitoring was expanded to 17 different sites throughout the animal's range to further conservation of the species and also to learn more about spatiotemporal trends in their calls. Let's see, go to the next one. Um, and then, as you can imagine, these long term passive acoustic monitoring data sets require robust and reliable automated methods to be able to detect the calls of the animals. Um, but the problem is that our current call detector has very high false positive rates. And this is due to all the anthropogenic noise that's present in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is problematic because the false positives have to be manually removed, and this takes quite a bit of time. And currently, the detector for the long bones has a miss rate of about 6.5 percent and a false detection rate of 26.4 percent, while the downsweep pulse detector has a miss rate of 12.6 percent and a false detection rate of 69 percent. And these detections are typically triggered by things like ship noise, discrete noise from when the um, recording instrument is saving the sound file, and also seismic noise and air guns that's pretty predominant throughout the Gulf. Can we move on to the next slide? So basically, detector detect any any sound. A lot right? of, yeah, it's triggered yeah, so very so easily. Easy, right, very easily. So it's not specific to, to it's know. meant to be able to detect the calls, but it picks up a lot of other different other, things. Right, so, so it detects the calls, but not on. And, right, so because it's a microphone. Thing. Right, yeah, <laughs> and other things as right. well. <laughs> So more recently, bioacousticians have been jumping on the deep learning trend um, and have been using deep learning methods for making detectors and classifiers of calls of different marine mammal species. And the deep learning methods have proven effective at reducing um, the error rates and also increasing or and speeding up the detection process and increasing the accuracy of detections in a lot of different species. So it's been done in North Atlantic right whales, humpback whales, sperm whales, orcas, belugas. And typically all of these studies have used convolutional neural networks, which are a class of deep neural networks that are very precise for image classification and image recognition problems. So the goal of this research was to develop a call detector for both types of the calls produced by the rice as well, the long bones and the down sweeps, and reduce the number of false positives. And obviously the detector would benefit ongoing and future passive acoustic monitoring studies. Excellent. And this slide I included to kind of highlight some of the differences between AI and machine learning and deep learning. I feel like this crowd probably might know this already, um, but this was something that I learned that I didn't know um, throughout this experience. So artificial intelligence um, can be defined as the effort to automate intellectual tasks that are normally performed by humans. So it's a general field that encompasses machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning is a subfield of AI in which computers are programmed to learn from data and then the rules that the computer learns can be applied to new data to answer new problems. And it's a means of achieving AI. And then deep learning is characterized by learning um, successive layers of increasingly meaningful representations of data. And um, typically, the, the deeper the network, the more layers that it has. And you, you'll start with lower layers, learning simple things like edges, and then higher levels of a deep neural network, learning more high, um, more complex features of a particular image, um, that it's, it's a particular feature that it's being trained for. Next. So as I mentioned, the type of neural networks that are typically used for the marine mammal classifiers are convolutional neural networks. And these are a class of deep neural nets that emerge from studies of the brain's uh, visual cortex. And people that were studying this found that 
neurons in the brain's visual cortex have a small local receptive field. So some neurons only respond to horizontal lines, while some neurons only respond to vertical lines, while some neurons respond to more complex patterns and have a larger receptive field. Um, and the patterns are combinations of lower level features. And convolutional neural networks work in a similar way. So uh, a neuron in the first convolutional layer of a network doesn't look at every single pixel of an input image, but only a small local receptive field. And then uh, similarly in the next convolutional layer, a neuron is not going to look at the entire preceding layer, but just a small rectangle in the first convolutional layer. Uh, next. And the convolution operation that's actually happening. Um, so a filter essentially moves across an image and activates certain features of an input image. So if you're using a vertical filter on the bottom image in the, this right picture, for example, um, everything that has vertical white lines gets highlighted and everything else gets blurred. And the same thing for a horizontal filter, but the reverse. And the filters are essentially just matrices of zeros and ones. And if you click the next button. Um, so this is how a filter will stride across an image. Um, so this would be a filter, for example, that has a size of three by three and a stride of one. And you'll notice that the output is the gray box and it's smaller than the initial input image. And typically as you get into the deeper layers of a convolutional neural network, the images get smaller and smaller, but the outputs get um, the feature maps that are the result of the convolution get deeper and deeper from all the filters that are placed on the image. And there are other important uh, layers in a convolutional neural network. For example, there's uh, activation layers and max pooling layers. And these essentially summarize what's going on in the convolutional layers. Uh, next. So this study uses a two-step convolutional neural network approach. Uh, if you get back. <laughs> um, oh, just once, yeah. So the first step involves uh, CNN that does object detection. And object detection is a process of finding objects within an image. So this is essentially what happens if you've ever noticed on Facebook when they can guess where your picture, where your face is in an image. Um, that's because when you tag a photo of yourself and your friends, you're essentially creating a labeled data set. So um, I did something very similar here. So with this network, I started with 504 hours of subsampled heart recordings from the rice and whale core habitats, and these are stored as 30 minute wave files. So then I created five minute spectrograms from the wave files, and I used the so six um, spectrograms per file, and then I used the start times and end times of the initial detectors detections from the old detector to create bounding boxes around call locations within the five minute spectrograms. So that's the input for the first CNN, which is uh, does object detection and the technical name for it is a faster region-based convolutional neural network. And I trained two detectors, one for each call using a ResNet 18 architecture using transfer learning. So a pre-trained model for a new problem. So that's the first step. And then the second step, I trained a second CNN that just does binary classification. So with this step, I used the same start and end times of the calls, but to in this step, I used I uh, created 30 second spectrograms that just focused on one particular call. And in total, there were about 1,500 examples of each call type. Oh, can you go back? Um, so 1,500 examples of each call type. And I also created examples of 30 second spectrograms where no calls were present. So it was just in the ways or calls of the opposite type. So this step trains a binary classifier to determine whether or not a call is present in a 30 second spectrogram. And I used a custom built network um, in this particular one with 30 layers. And it had six convolutional layers with the first and second convolutional layer having 16 and 32 filters and layers three, the uh, convolutional layers three through six had 64 filters. Did you check different times? Yeah, I experimented with different times. And, and that's what I was expecting. Yes. yes, and 30 seconds you figured that 
30 seconds is good because the average call length is about 20, but they can be a little bit longer. So I use 30 seconds. Um, that seemed to be good. And there, I did a lot of experimenting to figure out what would be better uh, time periods. Um, so those are the inputs to this network. And the purpose of this is that if a false, if there was a false detection in the first step, it would ideally be recognized here. Um, so when these two steps get put together and both networks are trained, so what happens to you have your sound file? Five minute spectrograms are created, they're run through the object detector, calls are detected, and then those start and end times are used to create 30 second spectrograms, which are run through a regular CNN, and that will have an output of yes, that was a call, or no, that wasn't a call. And this is kind of the data that can come out from um, the detector. So in the purple column over here, you can get the start time of calls and also the end times. Um, because since I know when the wave file starts, I can figure out when each spectrogram starts and then do a little bit of math and figure out what the call start and end time were and also generate information about the minimum and maximum frequency of the detected calls. And then the output for the second step is just whether or not the call was present. So we'll say long moan or a negative or a down sweep train or a negative. So in total, I trained four separate networks with two. So I trained two detectors for each call type with two steps. So four networks in total. And then the next one is the video. So I don't know if it's going to work if we try it here. I need to go to the other thing. Okay. <laughs> So the next slide that you're going to see is actually the detector um, detecting calls. So if you can make it a little bit bigger. Um, yeah, so we're starting um, inputting three 30-minute wave files, so we're in an hour and a half's worth of data. So those are the five-minute spectrograms being generated. Now they're being run through the object detector, so calls are being found. And the 30-second spectrograms are detected. And then here you can see some of the output. So it's a little bit blurry, but there was a negative detection here. So that was the whole purpose of the second step, that if there was a false detection, it would be picked up in the second step. And then I'm just opening up the, the start and end times of the calls. Uh -oh. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Um, so these are the results for the two object detectors, the faster region-based convolutional neural networks for the down sweeps and the long known calls. And you're looking at precision recall curves. So precision attempts to answer the question of what proportion of positive identifications were actually correct. Whereas recall is what proportion of actual positives were identified correctly. Um, so we can see that the down sweeps had an average precision of 0.93 across various levels of recall, so that's pretty good. Um, and then the long moans only had an average precision of 0.78 across various levels of recall, and I'm going to explain why I don't think uh, that one performed as well uh, in the discussion to go to the next one. And then these are the results for the second step, the binary classifiers for just the regular CNN that determines whether or not a call was present. So the top row shows the results for the down sweep detectors. And on the top left, you can see a confusion matrix. So um, in the top left corner of the matrix are the number of true positives. The bottom right is true negatives. And then top right is false positives. And bottom left is false negatives. Um, and then the ROC curve is on the right, and this plots the true positive rate against the false positive rate. And I have the formulas for uh, true positive rate and false positive rate down here. And when you look at the area under the ROC curve, that gives you an indication of how well the model actually performed, where the closer it is to one, the better the model. And these two models perform really, really well. So they have an AUC of 0.99. Um, so this says that they are really good at finding the calls within the 30 second spectrograms and differentiating between calls and noise. And go to the next slide. So overall, it seems that the detectors did a good job at reducing the false positive rates. So the initial long moan and down sweep detectors had false positive rates of 26% for long moans and the down sweeps again had 69% false positive rate where the second step, the CNN detector, had a false positive rate of 
4% for long loans and 3% for down sweeps. Uh, but to be fair, I need to analyze both of the steps together to actually measure the performance and see how it does when I combine uh, both detectors. There's still a few issues that I'm working the kinks out for. So one particular thing is um, when there's a lot of long bones that occur very closely to one another, sometimes they're not all detected. So in this particular example, there's three calls, but only two were detected. So I'm working on introducing more examples when this happens. So to improve the performance of the detector. Um, then another issue sometimes is if the call has harmonics, those can get detected as well, but this is less of a concern because I can essentially filter these out because I know their minimum and maximum frequencies. And if it's above the typical range for that call type, then I can just um, get rid of them in a spreadsheet. Um, overall, it seemed that the object detector for down sweeps perform better than the long loans. And I think that might be because this particular call type has a little bit more variability. So sometimes, um, and all the examples that I showed were pretty clean examples call, but you might only get the 150 hertz constant tonal or just the slope of the call or just the tail of the call. So I'm thinking if I have more examples of these call types, it might improve the performance. And uh, future steps that I'm currently working on right now. So I'm evaluating the performance using a multifold cross-validation experiment. Um, I'm going to put the two steps together and look at performance and then also compare performance and look at the false positive rates of this detector versus the initial ones using the same data set to see how both of them fare. And then finally, using the detectors for future passive acoustic monitoring studies. And I wanted to, of course, acknowledge everyone that was on my IDFC team. So Dr. Gangren and Dr. Mitsunori Obihar were very, very helpful. Um, I definitely wouldn't have been able to do this without them. Whenever I got stuck, they were always within reach and willing to talk. So that was really, really nice. So I really appreciate this whole experience for especially the mentorship uh, component of it. That was really valuable. Um, my two UM advisors, Dr. Babcock and Dr. Soldavia, and everyone that was involved in the data collection process, my committee members, and everyone that was part of the ship-based research. I come here for questions or just yes. say where I am. <laughs> so we can we have questions in the chat. Yeah, we got okay. So Check. Just put the form, you can change the form. So if anybody has any questions for Ashley. Can you change the It's fascinating if there is not a uh, uh, question in the chat. Actually, um, I, I have a question. I think this is really fascinating work. Uh, I mean, I, I think that this is um, this is great, and this is a great um, you know application of uh, how you can do deep learning and, uh, and neural net. I have a question though in terms of uh, you know you mentioned did you see variation in terms of the animals? So, for example, you know male, female, older animals versus uh, mm -hmm. so. Do you have that kind of differentiation in the, do you have at least data from that or? No, yeah, so that's the unfortunate downside to okay. the passive acoustics is it's all autonomous. So you don't sure. have the visuals to determine like what behavior is going on and how many animals and like exactly. So like if they were males or females. So you don't get that from just the call detection. So the purpose of this and for the future PAM studies is just to look at the total number of calls and then I'm going to be looking at modeling sound propagation to see how that actually turns out to how many animals. Um, but yeah, right now you can't really just get that from the autonomous reporting. So even from the, you know, for the two types of uh, calls, mm -hmm. so you, you cannot necessarily differentiate, you know, older animals no, no, not from or that. anything like that. No. Right. So, so that's basically, it's kind of, it's you limited, know, they're all together yeah. to some extent, mm -hmm. right? So. You can get signal to noise ratio and get an idea of how far the animal is from the detector, um, but that's pretty much yeah the extent of the information.
age. Right. And, and we don't really know, like, do older animals or males or females have, like, a higher call range and, like, use that to right. get some right. idea. Something like that. We don't know any of that. Yeah, there's still a lot to learn about okay. the species. Great. That's fantastic. No, that, but this is how you learn it, right? Yeah. You know, fantastic. Great. Great job. Thank you, Ashley. Hey. Oh, there's one question oh. from Daniel. Any sense of any sense of interaction from the call detection? Interaction in terms of between the end. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I guess if you you're, you can hear if you can like rephrase the question. If you mean like interaction, like two animals interacting um, based on the detections. I mean, you might be able to know if it's more than one if one calls immediately after the other animal. Uh, but right now, it's kind of you can't really get that information just from the autonomous recordings. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Great work. Thank you. Danny. Thank you, Ashley. So we're going to continue with our second fellow, Mindre, you wanna come up? Thank you everyone, my name is This is the microphone, so maybe get closer so they can hear you. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you everyone, my name is Emilia. So today my presentation will, I will talk about the cement nanostructure and its correlation between the uh, structure and the grid behavior in the concrete. So, next so uh, first I will just want to introduce a little bit about the concrete. So I think everyone is very familiar with the concrete. It is uh, mostly used man-made material in the world. So we use this green material here shown here and to build our buildings, bridges, and some theaters and other buildings. So actually the concrete is basically made by the cement, sand, gravel, and the water. So when we mix the cement with the water, they will form the paste, which is a glue, and those glue will bind the sand and gravel together, and when they get the hardened, they will form the concrete. Thank you. Uh, so, at, but the concrete is actually not very environmentally sustainable. Why? Because when we create the cement, uh, that is the glue, it will be responsible for the 8% of the carbon dioxide emissions created by the human beings. So at the new place here in 2019, actually the concrete is defined as the most destructive material in the world. So here, uh, down below the process show how we actually produce the uh, uh, cement. So actually, so the, that is the permanent cement, which is the uh, most economy type we use uh, uh, in the world. So we uh, show how we uh, make the Portland cement. So we actually uh, keep the limestone and also we use other material like the clay and we put them into the oven. And in the under the temperature temperature of about 1400 degrees Celsius, they will uh, have some uh, chemical reactions, and at the same time, the carbon dioxide will be integrated from the calcium carbonate, and that's why the carbon dioxide will be released into the atmosphere. And also uh, in the oven, we will have the some remaining hardened uh, material called the clinker, and we will ground those clay clinkers and mix with some small type of small amount of the gypsum to create the Portland cement. So that's a basically process of how we create the cement. So here, if we want to lower the man-made carbon dioxide emissions, one way of doing that is to decrease the cement consumption. So if we have very low uh, need, so, and then we could have less carbon dioxide emissions. And then one way of doing that is to increase the lifetime of our buildings. So there is a phenomenon here actually exists, exists in the concrete is that the grid will limit the lifetime of our buildings. So 
the, in the engineering, web is defined as the long term plastic deformation under the sustained load over a long time. Here, shown in this picture, it is the process of the quick deformation. So, actually, the quick deformation. Uh, the quick deformation uh, under the sustained load, they will cause a crack in those pictures. So those cracks, they will then accumulate and then go away to make the uh, concrete failure. And that's how we deteriorate our building materials. So if we really want to have the strong buildings, we need to solve that problem, that is to reduce the quick uh, occurrence in the concrete. So here comes the question, actually, how does the microstructure of the grid uh, uh, of the cement actually control the grid response of the concrete? So here we show the micro scales uh, in the cement uh, structure. Here, so we could see the cement that is from a kilometers of the bridges to centimeters, nanometers of the simulation cement block blocks here. So actually, oh, that's nice. So actually we could see the cement, it is a colloidal glass and we want to like to solve the glass problems to like to finally solve the grid uh, problem. So actually this slide shows the glasses. The glasses is also a very uh, promising, uh, glass is also a very important material. So because for the glass, the, even if it's in the solid or in the liquid, they have the very similar structures, uh, but they have uh, very different properties. For example, in the solid, the, the glass and the liquid, they, you, could, you could not tell their difference. But the, for the properties, the liquid, uh, for example, the viscosity of the glass, they could increase by 40 uh, orders of magnitude compared to the solid glass. So that's why so many people, they are also dealing with the glass problems. And they put forward a lot of questions and they want to know uh, actually what the uh, nature inside of the glass. So even the Nobel Prize winner in the last year, they were dealing with the physics problems. They, they also focus on the glass problems. So our goal actually in this project is to understand the relationship between the structure of the glass and its macroscopic dynamics. So here uh, we use the model system of a glass called the Cobb Anderson model. And we also add the unit axle stress onto our system with the molecular dynamics simulations. And this all oh, this supposed to have an animation here. So actually, those, they will show a deformation of the simulation box and all the particles move inside of it. And here, this picture here shows the output of our simulations. So here we've got the strain versus curve. So the, in engineering, we define the strain that is a deformation of a solid uh, due to the stress. So here we could see the deformation is very fast in the beginning and it will slow down by the end. And here, the green lines here represents the issue of the result from the different simulations, and the black curve here shows their average result. So actually, the change of the deformation uh, describes the grid behavior, and we use these different plots here to like to tell the process of the deformation. And we also characterize the macroscopic dynamics using the particle displacements. The displacement actually is the distance of the particle movement from the one step to the other. And here it's, well, it's supposed to have a... yeah. no. So here we quantify the different particle movements uh, using the different shapes, uh, different sizes, and different colors in the whole simulation processes. And we also use the uh, we use different sizes. The larger the size, the more. Uh, displacement, the particle move, and use, also use different colors. So here in the red, we show our statistical result of the particle displacement distribution. So here uh, comes the question, could we predict the particle movements using their structure matrices shown in the left? 
So according to the previous experience, the simple structure matrices we calculated from the structures, they cannot predict the particle displacements, but the machine learning, uh, they could better, very better identify the complex patterns. So from the previous work published by the other scientists, they successfully use the classification to tell the difference about the particles. They have a very high mobile uh, properties to that don't, don't really move. But so in our project, we, we want to create some regression models to predict those uh, particle displacements according to some very complex structural matrices using the like deep learning and other regression models. So the first thing of what we need to do is to understand those particle displacements. So here we plot the data, uh, which is the same one we plot the histogram, but here we show them in the same log axis. And the thick green line here shows the whole trend. And here we fit different curves on that. So you can see actually the chi distribution really cannot really fit the distribution, which means the particle displacements move in the x, y, and z directions. They are not Gaussian distributed. Uh, but the bird distribution perfectly fits those trends and especially those heavy tails. So the heavy tails, it has a meaning that the particle displacement, they, they are very large but they have the lower frequency compared to the very low movement of those particles here. So the next thing we are going to do is to learn more about the bird distribution and we try to uh, link the bird distribution to describe the wave mechanisms at the moment, those particles move forward particles. So next slide. So this slide here we show the equation of how to, how to calculate the bird distribution uh, is PDF and here we have three parameters. The first two parameters, the T and C, they are the, the shape of parameters and the alpha means the scale of the parameters. And down below here, we show the plots of uh, showing the correlation between the three parameters. Uh, here we plot the k versus c and the k versus alpha. And here we can see those three parameters, they are very highly correlated. So which means we could use just one single parameter to describe the other two. And we also calculate the KC ratio versus the cycles. That is uh, the time of the, uh, that, that is could also be represented at the time. So actually the KC ratio, they increase logarithmically with the time. And here we use this orange line to represent the average pool result. And also uh, remember we showed the string that also changes logarithmically with the time. So actually we want to use this macroscopic dynamics of the system to describe the macro response of the system. That, that is the string. So next slide. So right now we understand we're gonna to predict that is the displacement of the distribution. And then we want to use the calculate the features of the machine for, for the machine learning models. So we divide our features based on the paper published in 2019. Next. So here we capitalize the distances, areas, and volumes uh, for the, each of the atom according to its neighbors. And then we derive the statistics that is mean, medium, max, and standard deviation uh, for uh, by according by considering all the neighbors and for each atom. Next. Next. And we also at the same time calculate the medium range order features by doing the statistics around all the neighbors, their short range orders for each atom. So both of these features they aim to calculate the relative uh, amount of empty space for each atom. So here in total, we calculate the 60 features, uh, the short range order features plus the medium range order features. And we show the histogram here to see actually how they look like. And so for the current progress, uh, we have already performed all the class simulations so that we could have all the uh, data set. 
And then we already have finished the Python script to calculate the, all the features and the displacements. And then uh, we also did the feature importance analysis to then we select the most important 15 features uh, and then input them into the machine learning model. But right now, it, we just have the very pre preliminary findings. We did one single simulation to add, add them into the regression models. So here we tried the deep neural network and actually goes However, we didn't get the very promising result here, but for the next step, the most important thing we need to do is to fine tuning the models to like to get them better in performance of those models. And we also, uh, at the meantime, to considering to generate new features to encode the local heterogeneity of the class systems. And we still need to better understand the wave driving mechanisms while considering those for distribution. And if we have a better output of those machine learning models, we are thinking to build a time series of, of the deep learning networks for you know, predict the whole wave deformation process. So in the end, I want to thank my academic advisor, Dr. Luis Pastana, and my IDS mentor, Dr. Ayala. So I really learned a lot of the machine learning techniques theory and such process, and I really thank your help. Any questions? The floor is now open. You can unmute yourself to ask them or write them on the chat. This is also very nice. And, and you, you are doing, you know, the uh, MD simulation test, right? Yeah. So and you are extracting the feature from the MD simulation. Yes, yes. Right. So that's that's actually it's, and when you say the 60 features, is it you know your first approximation or uh, how did you come up with that? So as I said, some other scientists they have a better results, so they did a classification to classify those highly uh, mobile particles from those non-mobile ones. So that's why we want to like apply their model, apply their way of calculating those features, but we want to use the regression to actually predict the exact magnitude of those displacements. Okay, I was getting the into them. So, but currently you were using whatever is available in the literature for those. For yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. so I was wondering whether this would come from your regression. No, no. But we also, right now, we, when we output from the MD simulations, we also get the, like other data. So we, we have the threat. We have the stress data, so actually it shows uh, the average stress theory different times the how much it will add to the particles. So, and we also calculate different like volumes. So here they calculate the tetrahedral volume, yeah. but for us we calculate the volume volume. So that's also different. So we are also considering different features compared to the literature. That's what I was trying to get, whether you get these uh, features and so forth, because you know the machine learning models, right? The, the features are the most important component, right? How many you have, and what are the contribution of all of these features? In many cases, you know, the features is, is the one that determines the success. Yeah, the exactly. The but finding the features to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, we, we apply the most latest latest results. So okay. they, they did good job in the classification for what we want to move on to this. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. So we're gonna continue with Kevin. Kevin, stand here, come over here. That's better. Here? I think yeah. they, they, they can see you better with the microphone. Okay. They can see you also on the screen. Well, we cannot, you know, we cannot see you. You cannot see yourself there, but they can see you. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we, my IDSC fellowship 
was looking at expanding the functional control of the brain computer interface that we have. Um, and so that's my primary uh, project in my uh, graduate work. And so the idea here is uh, with this system that we have is see how much we can actually leverage uh, above and beyond what we currently have. And so to kind of dive into this, for those who aren't familiar, I want to start talking a little bit about brain computer interfaces to move forward. Um, so brain computer interfaces uh, really allow um, the brain a direct connection to uh, a computer or other devices in, in the outside world. So typically in, in neuroscience, the neuroscience system, we, we consider movement and behavior a result of some electrical signals within the brain that then allow us to move and produce the behaviors that we have. Brain computer interfaces uh, sort of allow a, a, a connection beyond that normal route. Um, and in our case, this is uh, used to sort of circumvent damaged tissue within the spinal cord of, a, of an individual with uh, quadriplegia. Um, and this brain computer interface uh, systems typically range from a, a variety of modalities for how we collect that data. On an non-invasive side, there's electroencephalography, which is EEG, where the electrodes are placed on the surface of the scalp. Um, and this is nice because it uh, is ubiquitously uh, available. It doesn't require surgery, um, but there are some downsides to this in that uh, the, the source of uh, our signal that we want is down here, but we have the skull and scalp, muscle, fascia layers that really diminish uh, the signal and create artifacts. So, I mean, even things like raising the eyebrows, moving the eyes, or any sort of movement can induce, uh, induce noise. Uh, on the more invasive side, we have electroporticography, so it's similar to EEG, but this is placed on the surface of the cortex. And uh, intracortical microelectric arrays are spine filaments that can be pushed into the tissue of the brain that really kind of position these things uh, around the, the nervous tissue and the neurons, where you can almost get uh, you know, individual unit protections. Um, where here, ECOG, you're getting more of a local field potential, uh, but still able to kind of listen in on what's going on in the underlying tissue. And so we can go next. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, this is a video uh, you can play, but we see here that um, uh, he's I hooked up to this computer where on the screen it would show uh, two prompts, rest or move. And so this was the first goal that we had once he was implanted with his device a couple of years ago. Um, and as those uh, presentations or instructions were presented to him, he would actively think, you know, move his hand or not. And then those were used to train basic uh, classifiers to determine or to then, you know, classify that. And then with that signal, trigger functional electrical stimulation, which is electrodes placed on his forearm that would allow, that would basically reactivate his muscle and open and close his hand. So from this point, we have a basic concept of the laboratory, but what we really wanted to do with our device, because it was fully implanted, uh, if you've seen other uh, media presentations of brain computer interfaces in the news or the media. Most of those demonstrations are used in a laboratory with intracortical microelectric arrays, which really allows robust uh, function. Um, so our goal here was because this is fully implanted, decreased uh, potential for infection, we really wanted to push the utility of this system out into beyond the lab. And so that was uh, my goal first coming in that we got started. So we can go to the next point here was to really make sure that uh, this could be used at the home. Uh, so this video would show uh, the setup of the caregiver, right? We need to make sure that this is a burden for the caregiver once they're there. Otherwise, they'll not have much of incentive to use it. So uh, they were able to put it together in about five minutes. Uh, so this, the setup is pretty quick. Um, and we go to the next slide. I don't know if we'll be able to see it, but it'd be another video that shows how they're able to do the same data collection process in the home. And so uh, they have this app that we developed, and they're able to get them or their caregiver configure different portions of the system at home. So um, even in the future, if we wanted to do, you know, a non-invasive uh, approach to this as well, kind of doing a tandem, we could simply plug it in and play. Um, and with this device, he's able to click that button, and then it presents to him move and rest and as he's looking at that, thinking of those things to collect our data. Um, and this is really beneficial for us because it allows us to gain uh, a lot more data outside of what would, what would be required of it otherwise. So he no longer has to worry about figuring out transportation to get to our lab to do much of that. All of this can be done in his own time. And we'd often do things late into the night where it's more easy, it's easier for him 
uh, and his caregivers to, to get around those those uh, issues. And so this, this video shows that with our current setup, he was able to use this binary classifier to, to control this glove. Now, we didn't want to use electrical stimulation in the home for safety reasons, so instead we hooked him up with this glove and had a motor on the back that allowed him now to open and close his fingers and pick up things like his headphones. Um, okay, so let me go to the next thing. So with the background of what we've done so far kind of uh, established, the goal of uh, the next steps, particularly for this IBS fellowship, was to then increase the degrees of freedom, right? So we only have this binary uh, motor imagery of nothing or movie. So the idea here was to see if we could increase the number of, of motor imagery that he could do and see if we could classify that. Really, we want to ideally do that real-time classification. Uh, you can imagine that uh, one potential uh, application of this could be that similar to the functional electrical stimulation that we have on this hand, if we could do more of that, we could do much more movement with those being classified. Um, and then eventually uh, go on to doing uh, neural signal regression on a 2D axis where you could end up controlling a cursor uh, and eventually translate that into the control of his own uh, wheelchair. So, however, there's some significant limitations with what, uh, what we have. The system or the ECOG channels uh, that we have, we only have eight of them. Uh, well, sorry, eight electrodes, which result in, and I'll get into this a little bit, two channels of time series electric photography. That's a limitation on how much we're actually getting. And then this is only uh, utilized on one side of the brain. So we're really only getting information from this dominant hemisphere, um, which correlates with right hand. So this kind of describes the uh, data collection methods. We'll stop there. Um, and so we have these uh, electrodes placed on the surface of the brain. It sits over the area of the brain that's generally responsible for a uh, dominant right hand. Movement. So he's a right handed uh, individual. And these electrodes are placed in bipolar mode, so uh, in pairs, basically, which gives us four channels, two of which are time series. Uh, the other two are uh, sampled at a lower rate and really just getting the, uh, the power between 12 and 30 hertz uh, periodically in that same region. And uh, so you click again. So we had to adapt the, uh, the phone. It won't play, but you would just have to click this button here and we adapted the phone uh, app so that instead of just presenting move and rest, now it would present rest and then some uh, instruction to move. Now we didn't want to, we realized that having him read out the full instruction it was things like wrist flexion extension, elbow flexion extension, wrist or thumb adduction, abduction. Those are really long to read. And so to get, uh, make it a little bit more intuitive, we actually had a GIF images that would just automatically start playing so we could see that and then start going. And so while he would watch that, we would then record the signal so he goes next. Um, and as that signal is coming, this is uh, an example of what a, that signal would look like. This has gone through a 100 high pass filter using a, a finite impulse response. And uh, on the bottom, you can see the, the prompt trace for it was going back and forth between rest and some imagery back and forth. And we would do this twice over. It doesn't go all the way through here on this image. Uh, and that would be one run to collect that data. Um, so we can go to the next. And here, what we would do is these are each six second time windows and we just kind of chunk those up into windows. And then we click again, we would label these as a rest or move, uh, not just move, but you know, whatever the label that was being shown. And then we translate that over into the frequency domain. So we go from the time to the frequency in order to get these spectral features um, similar uh, to what Ash was shown earlier. And uh, from here, what we did is this gives us, if we click one more time, 601 different uh, values here. And that all correlates down to 1,206, uh, 204 features when we flat all of those values together. And so we click again, this would give us, uh, you know, our samples and rest and move. And then we click one more time, which would result in our full training set of N samples and N features that then we would have uh, labeled with the different labels that they were looking at at the time. And so from here, uh, the session parameters that we had, we had eight total instructions, rest and hand grasp, wrist flexion extension, elbow flexion extension, and some adduction and adduction. Um, and it would alternate between these two. Now, because it was constantly alternating between these movement instructions and rest, we had a, a clear class and balance problem where we needed to make sure that, you know, if we're going to train this on some sort of classifier, that it's not going to be inherently biased towards the rest feature, which we certainly saw the initial cats going around because of the confusion nature, everything was going to zero, everything's a rest. Uh, simply because it's based off of probability that it would go there. Um, and so to handle this for some of those classifiers, we, we would do random undersampling in order to uh, keep the data there 
Uh, one potential thing that we are interested in doing in the future is that data augmentation, where we're kind of like bringing those features or bringing the other ones up. Um, and so we started this data collection and uh, over the last previous couple months, got a total of 70 runs and we're still collecting more data on this uh, in order to do more robust classification methods. Um, and we have at the time of, of these results, just underneath 2000 different motor injury instruction trials, those six seconds I'm getting. Slide. So this is the, the first little bit of data visualization that we're getting from the two time series channels translated into a spectrogram over time. And so this is uh, one run. So again, they're repeated twice where we go through all of the different motor images and then again. Uh, and you can already see some of the features that are there. It's pretty clear uh, where the rest versus when he wants to. He's thinking about moving. Now, he's not actually moving. This. He's only thinking about it. So you can see in the area between 15 to 30 hertz, you can see it starts with a light value and it goes dark and light to dark and light. And that's uh, what's called event-related desynchronization, which is a result of him thinking about moving. And so it goes dark uh, as he thinks about that. And this is kind of related to a little bit of neuroscience here where they actually think that uh, you know the, the cortex is actively trying to suppress that movement. And then when there's an intention to move, that uh, inhibition is, is, is released. Um, but the, the other promising thing that a colleague of mine actually pointed out is even though we're really only seeing stark differences between the rest and the move states, if you look down here into the lower frequency areas, you can also see that there's you know, pretty light and then differences here. And those two areas here actually correspond to the areas where the subject is thinking about moving more proximal joint. Um, so promising initially thinking that you know, these are some things that we can start looking at that will be promising features for classifying these different imagery. Now, if we you know, set like basically cut out each one of those little strips, average them together, we get this going. And each one of these is a different uh, modality with the two channels. So we have rest, grasp, wrist, uh, extension, reflection, elbow. Um, and again, it's pretty clear rest between the between the others uh, or compared to the others. Uh, but in the movement ones, there's only subtle differences that we really want to try to pick up on, which was the goal of this of this function. So we'll go forward. And so because we have 1,204 features there, the first thought was to do some dimensionality reduction. So we looked at a principal component analysis and found that of all, you know, of all of them, there was 429 principal components that made up 90%, 95% of the variance. And if you, you know, plot that uh, effective variance or explained variance, you really only look at you know, four to five of those principal components that make up a lot of that variance. Uh, when I ran the data through the principal component, we didn't really see any promising separation here. Um, between them. Although you do kind of see that there's a little bit of separation between the rest, which is all those blue uh, parts. And so I was thinking, you know, perhaps we can run this through a, a PCA with a kernel. Um, and in order to do that, I wanted to, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can do that using either a linear basis function, you know, so the sigmoid or uh, a, you know, polynomial, which is what we ended up doing. And I, I determined what we would do based off of the reconstruction error. So when you throw it through the PCA and it, you know, does the principal component and then you reconstruct it, see how much does that change between the original, uh, the original placement and the resulting uh, image? How do, when we minimize that, so we click next. And so I found that the, the best was a fourth degree polynomial kernel uh, that actually ended up with this weird work screw shape that kind of pushed all of the motor imageries where they're uh, thinking about movement to like this edge, almost like this comet shape. And I should say that there's actually like uh, five components here. So we're only looking at three of the five dimensions. But still, this wasn't uh, convincing or robust enough to say that we're actually going to be able to detect things from here. So uh, move forward to a, um, a supervised learning style of dimensionality reduction. So using linear discriminant analysis and click forward. Um, and here's where we start to see a little bit more separation. But now, the caveat here is that this is, because this is supervised learning, uh, the next thought would be, well, how is this going to work on no novel data? So it doesn't actually uh, um, put these points into the exact spot, but it's pretty close. So we click next. And just to make sure that we could separate this, looking at this uh, after LDA, LDA or lineage analysis into TSNI, you see a nice uh, separation here, at least for visualization, since uh, TSNI are not allowed to or couldn't use it as part of the classification scheme. Um, so going next, so then once we uh, push this through a variety of different classifiers, uh, so the baseline, uh, there, these are basically slightly better than chance. The best one that came out 
held was sort of rich classifier performing only at 53 percent which was not promising and i should also say that all of these classifiers were trained on 70 70 percent of the data and validated on 30 percent of the data all using a tenfold uh, cross-validation method and so thinking knowing that within the neural signals uh, there can be a drift over time and how these things change which also might explain why the novel linear discriminant analysis uh, data as it's pushed through the data discriminant analysis doesn't always end up right. So perhaps there's a temporal component that we need to be considering. And so uh, we, to make a quick next, also looked into a hit markup model. Uh, and so in this case, you have uh, what you're observing. These observations are the, the neural signal that we're seeing, which are uh, coming from the neural uh, state, the motor state that the patient is thinking of. So they're thinking, you know, whatever they want to move, we can't see that. That's hidden behind this curtain. But what we are seeing is the neural signal. And as they change from one thought to the next, there's some probability, right, that that's going to uh, make that switch. And then as there's that probability of making that switch, there's the probability of seeing the new neural signal. And so looking at how can we train the, the system to predict what are the probabilities given what we're currently seeing now, which would also allow us to do real-time classification. So when we did this, it's being clicked next, we got, uh, so we did, the new discriminant analysis is when we can see some sort of separation, push it through a hit markup model, um, and then use linear, oh, sorry, logistic regression to start separating it out. Got up to 74%. Now, I should also emphasize that this is still processing, so this is just the best score that we saw so far. Um, uh, it was actually taking a really long time because we were trying to do, uh, or I was hoping to do hyper hyperparameter optimization on both the number of components that LDA was giving us, as well as the hit markup model, because you could have two, three, four states. And given logically that we have uh, eight of these different imageries, uh, around seven to eight of those hit markup states was giving us the high accuracy. So this is still processing, and we're hoping to uh, continue that to see if we can get it better. And we have, I didn't even start looking at the hyperparameters for logistic regression, so that's another step that we want to go. But this was promising in the fact that we see, we start to see better classification when we're starting to incorporate time. So we can go to the next slide. So really looking at the next step of this. Uh, because we have to see that time component, it's looking at time series analysis. Um, there have been other studies that use recurrent neural networks that we really want to get into, specifically using long, long short, uh, or sorry, yeah, I think it's long short term memory within those recurrent neural networks uh, in order to allow us to take that time that the, the system has previously seen and incorporate that into each new, uh, I guess, snapshot of the neural features that it's seeing, as well as going into deep learning. You know, perhaps one of the things that we also need to consider is looking at non-linear transformations of our features prior to feeding them into the, into the neural networks. You know, are there, are there sinusoidal or cosine type uh, transformations we need to make? Perhaps the, the data is really non-linear that we need to, to need to adjust for. So those are some of the things that I'm really curious of seeing, will that help improve some accuracy? Once we have that, then going on further to the 2D kinematic trajectory decoding, um, you know, and hoping to get back to the 2D states of you know, moving a cursor, allowing you to move this wheelchair around. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank uh, my primary mentor, Abhishek Prasad, and my IDC mentor, uh, Odelia Schwartz, for uh, her mentorship and help in helping us classify these things and separating out the signatures, and also for the IDC for this chance of intelligence to do this. Yeah. So the electrodes were implanted in the motor cortex, I assume? Right over the sensor motor, sensory motor region. Yeah. Sensory motor region. Yeah. yeah, so it spans, it kind of spans a little bit over that central part. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you consider it implanting electrodes? Yes. So, I mean, uh, that is actually a hopeful goal, uh, a grant in the works right now to, to do not just those other areas, but even more electrodes that would cover larger real estate of the brain. Because uh, you can imagine that, you know, pre-motor and other areas would help us classify that a little bit for sure. Yeah, second question. Uh, have you considered comparing to like EEG data? Because you might pick up more real potential uh, instead of just little very localized. Yeah, so that's another thing I'm actually interested in is, is uh, you know, similar to, um, what's that technique called when you take the top off the mill? Uh, you were explaining it a second ago. Because there's EEG net and you can do uh, transfer learning. Sorry. So you take so EEG net is one that has been done on EEG data, and that's pretty similar, right? They're still using it for motor imagery and seeing if we can take the top off that and maybe retrain a little bit based off of this econ data. Um, and then also making sure that this can, 
you know, how, how generalized it is, this, right? Because right now we're only getting this from this subject. Uh, you know, if we get online data from other, it's a little difficult though, because a lot of other, the nice thing that we have here is this is a, as a quadriplegic subject, and it might be a little different than other ECOG online uh, available data, where a lot of that is collected from able-bodied epilepsy patients who they're trying, a lot of the ECOG studies are done in, in hospital settings uh, there. So there could be some difference there, but still things that might be able to help boost our productivity faster, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And it, with those patients, I, I believe sometimes the brain areas that they can use tend to shrink a little bit in other areas and have to go for that real estate. And those things. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I've asked no, a lot of questions. This is, this is actually, uh, I really want to answer this question. Yeah, because, and, that's, and that's really difficult to answer right now because we have uh, one subject here. Uh, obviously, they're able to at least control this mechanism. And the other thing that we're hoping is we're collecting all of this data is um, so the, the binary classifier that we have right now is also using a Markov model. And we've only needed to train that two years ago and it's never lost its accuracy. Um, so the other potential question you could ask is, you know, is his current, uh, you know, mapping the same as it was before, right? Because, you know, what is he actually thinking the thing that he needs to do and it could change? Uh, you know, how do we measure that neural capacity setting? These are really exciting questions that hopefully we can answer, but yeah, not awesome. part of this project. Cool work. Great. Any, any other questions? Thank you. And so now we're to our last fellow, Julian. First one. Okay. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. Cool. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Julian Dalmar. My presentation is a little different, uh, so I tried to do it in a Jupyter notebook because I figured it would be a little more interactive and you can see some of the background thing. Um, so just scroll down yeah. or oh, you can yeah scroll up a little bit. okay so so the title of my project is a cluster analysis of corporate inhalation morphology in alzheimer's disease and healthy controls uh, and really the research question we wanted to answer here was do corporate inhalation size shape and location influence alzheimer's disease diagnosis uh, so just a little background on Alzheimer's disease. It's actually, it's so, it's the number one leading cause of dementia. And actually now recently the number six leading cause of death. So it's really kind of a public health crisis. Uh, and clinically it presents itself with, generally with memory deficits, um, but also other cognitive deficits occur in some individuals. Now, pathologically, I'm over at the brain bank doing my thesis uh, and we, we find in Alzheimer's disease, a lot of the times, mainly it's characterized by a, a buildup of protein deposits. And, and two of those are, are amyloid beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, which is hyperphosphorylated tau. Now, where the tau is located and how dense the inclusions are, are actually very strongly associated with the cognitive dysfunctions found in So. As we can see here at the, in this picture above, this is the, the progression of tau through Alzheimer's disease. So it starts really in the middle areas of the brain in the enterinal regions, spreads through the limbic regions of the brain. And finally, in late stage disease, you really get a high density of tau in the hippocampal region, which is the learning and memory section of the brain, as well as uh, tau throughout the entire brain. Um, so corporate amylasia, what are those? Well, corporate amylasia are essentially these vesicles that clean up cellular waste. So they're essentially like trash cans. Uh, and recently, research has found that tau is actually inside of these corporate amylasia. So it has been postulated that these corporate amylasia may be acting as kind of a resistance mechanism or a protective mechanism against Alzheimer's disease. So if that is so, understanding more about program relations is essential because that could open up the, you know, the world to multiple different types of research for biomarkers, therapeutic you know, strategies, uh, and many other things. So this, there's really a lot of biological significance. 
it's related to these program initiatives. Um, one thing I want to mention before moving on, and because we considered this in our analysis, is uh, APOE4, which is the strongest associated risk allele for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so if you have one or two of those alleles, it increases your chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. So really what we wanted to do with this analysis was carry out a detailed characterization of corporate Malaysia uh, and perform also an exploratory analysis in ADN control brains. So let's scroll down a little bit. So the data set that we had here um, consists of nine AD cases and four controls. So these were brains that were uh, donated to the brain bank from donors and they were section stained and digitized analysis. So what this means is that the brain was, the hippocampus was taken out of the brain, uh, cut very thinly, and then extended onto a slide. Uh, and then what we do is we add different chemicals to try to bring out features that we're interested in. So in this case, we use something called a PAS stain, a periodic acid shift, uh, and that highlights the core brain so we'll, we'll be able to see them in these brain tissue samples. And then we digitize them, um, and they actually turn out to be these massive images, uh, very high resolution. We're able to zoom in and do different quantifier uh, analysis and then different things. So, um, so then what we did here, you can scroll down a little bit, show you a picture, um, up a little bit more. Yeah, okay. So this is an example of uh, one of the tissue. It, it should have been a little re uh, better resolution, but I had to compress it for, for the purposes of this guitar. But what you see here is these little pink circles are actually program relation. And what we did with each of these subjects was to quantify different metrics about them. Uh, what we really wanted to know is, does the area matter? Does, you know, because if they are bigger, that could mean that there's more trash and potentially more tau inside of them. Um, but does the circularity matter? It's like you know, some of them are more circular, some of them are more oval shaped. Uh, and is that important in disease pathogenesis? Um, and then also the nearest neighbor. So this is a, essentially a way to measure the clustering profile of these. As you can see in this picture, they're clustering um, very much along these ventricle linings. And, and the ventricles are essentially these fluid filled areas of the brain uh, that help nourish different brain tissues. So, uh, and then the last metric that we calculated for each one of these uh, was, or actually for each subject, which was um, the percent area occupied. So essentially that is a, a metric to, you know, how many are in a given area and normalized by the size of the area. So this, I really like this picture, um, partly because it's kind of Miami colors. <laughs> you know, you have the neon pink and the neon blue. Um, but also because it demonstrates a lot of what's happening with core granulation. And really what happens with those are, the idea is that they are exported out of the brain. So they collect waste over time and then they leave the brain um, and they actually go into the cervical lymph nodes where they are cleaned up and exported out of the body. So yeah, go down a little bit. So yeah, this is just some of the code. I'm gonna skip by this. Um, yeah, right there is okay. So the first, um, what we wanted to do is we had all these data and we don't know if any of it's important. You know, we collected a lot of data. We know core granulation are important, but we don't know if these metrics about each individual one is important. So we did some unsupervised learning techniques. Uh, this one was called UMAP. So UMAP stands for Uniform, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection for Dimension Reduction. <laughs> Quite a mouthful, uh, but essentially similar to TSNE, and PCA, like we saw in the previous presentation, but in, it is a nonlinear dimensionality uh, reduction technique. So we decided to use the CA as the unit of measurement. Uh, since we only had nine cases and uh, four controls, that's only 13 samples. So in order to increase our N and to explore from a cell level, we actually uh, quantified these metrics for all of them. And we ended up with a data set of around 3,000 per granulation. So that greatly increased our data set. Uh, and it allows us uh, to do more types of analysis. So I just scroll down a little bit. So we ran the data through these, uh, this non-linear dimensionality reduction technique, and then we overlaid different characteristics of each patient. So in this case, we, had, we overlaid whether the corporate Malaysia came from a control or an AD patient. Uh, and while there's not perfect separation, 
there is some interesting, um, there was, were some interesting results here. You know, we see we have this group over here to the left that is very isolated from the rest, and they happen to be all from AD patients. Uh, and then we have the controls, you know, a strong control group over here, but then we have this mixed group. So we didn't get perfect um, separation, but we got some interesting data that we wanted to investigate a little bit further. What were the input features? Sorry. The input features were the size and the circularity. So one being a perfectly circle, you know, zero being like a line. Um, the, the nearest neighbor, so how close they are to each other. And then kind of a population density metric based on how many are in the given area. So the next thing we wanted to do uh, was look at the location within the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is an extremely important structure in learning and memory. It has thousands and millions of projections going in and out, a lot of activity in this area. Um, and it has multiple areas within, uh, within the hippocampus. So we chose two areas. Uh, one of the areas is the CA1 and one is the CA3. Um, and this is important because CA3 is thought to be implicated in later disease states. So as you progress through Alzheimer's disease, you see more pathology in the CA3 region. So what we saw here was also interesting is that the same group that was AD happens to also be uh, in the CA3 region. Um, and then CA1, you know, kind of here, but then we also have a lot of mixed together. So it wasn't perfect separation, but this group on the left is, is extremely interesting because they're separated, they're AD, they're CA3, um, and then we actually go on in the next plot to look at genetic risk. So here um, is what I was explaining a little bit earlier about APOE. So this plot uh, color codes each dot. So, so APOE is, is um, the number one, the strongest associated risk allele for Alzheimer's disease. And you can actually go to 23andMe and get your, <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Uh, it's stressful. Um, yeah, you can actually get tested and see if you have this risk factor, any of you are interested. Um, but essentially, zero being you don't have any of the alleles, so your risk is kind of neutral considering uh, that this allele, uh, one of them is high risk and then two, you know, even higher risk. Uh, so what we see here is a little similar to the previous plots is that this group over here is very homogeneous uh, and it happens to be the, the people with high risk but not extremely high risk. And then we also have the big mixed group over here, but also the low risk people tend to be clustered too. Uh, in kind of the middle area. But the real question is that why is this, why do we have this mixed group? So one of the things we wanna do in the future is actually exclude these two groups from the analysis and run it again and see if we get further separation in the groups. Okay. Yeah, uh, in terms of numbers, like counts for each of those things, you know, uh, non-risk, a lot of deals, two deals. Yeah. What's the number of patients? Is it pretty equal? Is that uh, that's a good question. So for, it's tough because if you have Alzheimer's disease, it's likely that you have at least one or two of these. So that does kind of bias the data a little bit considering we have more AD patients. Um, but we also have individuals that don't have, so they have low risk, but they have AD. So that's actually something in my dissertation research that we're looking at, we call them resistant individuals. Uh, because they have extremely high risk for AD, but they don't get AD. So we have some people like that, and then there's the opposite. They don't have any risk, but they get AD. So it's it's uh, it's not a clear path to AD. It just helps explain the risk um, for developing AD. So, yeah, so moving down a little bit. So the next thing we want to do, a lot of overlays on this plot to really tease out of uh, these relationships because um, we had a lot of clinical data about each of the subjects and we wanted to see how that related to our unsupervised learning. Um, so this is um, this is B-score, so overlaid by B-score. So what is B-score? Well, B-score measures, it's a semi-quantitative approach to measure tau load in an individual. 
And so tau being the, the strongest they associate with pathogenic feature of Alzheimer's, uh, and zero being you don't have any tau, and then three being you have a lot of tau in a lot of places. Uh, so really, that's when you're getting to very severe disease. Uh, like you would, yeah. So interestingly enough, in this plot, we found that this group over here happens to be not the, you know, we expected them to be the extreme group of tau, you know, very high levels of tau. But in fact, the majority of them are actually this intermediate tau. So this is important because you know, we've showed in previous research and with our collaborators that as tau increases, the core granulation numbers also increase. But once you get to severe disease, the core granulation drops off extremely sharply. So this is, we, we, we believe that this is because core granulation are working to sequester the tau and get rid of it in the body, but they're there comes a point where it's just too much and there's a failure of this mechanism to clean up the pathology. And then there's a severe drop off. So this, this uh, actually supports our data that we've seen um, from other studies. So this was very interesting. Um, so scrolling down a little bit. So the conclusions of this section are uh, the CA in the CA3 region of the 80 patients, they appear to be a little bit different with respect to their size, shape, uh, population, as well as uh, their nearest neighbor in the clustering profile. Over. So what we wanted to do next was apply some supervised learning, machine learning techniques to see if we can train algorithms to take one single core Malaysia and tell us whether it came from control or case. Now, this is important because these metrics that we are inputting into the model are not associated with it. Nobody has ever shown that they are associated with AD. So we could deduce that if the models are able to predict case or control, there might actually be some important data that we're collecting uh, and that merits further exploration because um, it's, they're not associated with the outcome, but if the model is able to predict it, there has to be something within that data that is allowing the model to predict it. So the first thing we did was use a, a k-nearest neighbor algorithm, um, which is essentially a clustering algorithm, but it, it can also be used as a classification model. Um, and we got an accuracy score of 58, nothing special, so a little bit better than random. Um, one other thing we wanted to do while modeling was to rank the feature importance. So we wanted to know which of our features are the most important in prediction uh, so we can take that back to our research and say, okay, this is what we need to be focusing on because this is the strongest predictor for our models. Um, so we moved on to a logistic regression model. We got about the same, 58, nothing special, um, but we were able to extract the coefficients from that model uh, and to see how they related with our outcomes. And what we got was that circularity actually was positively associated with controls. So controls tended to have more circular core granulation um, and less percent area occupied. So there were less uh, core granulation per given field in the controls and they were more circular. So this might suggest that, you know, circularity could suggest that they were functioning properly and abnormal shapes might suggest that there's some sort of dysfunction. Is this related to size as well? Yeah, so size actually, the area was one of the weakest coefficients. So it seems that size might not be important considering that uh, we are trusting the model's coefficients. Um, but yeah, circularity, uh, your question was, is circularity and size correlated? Yeah, I haven't looked into that, but that actually might be, that could be interesting. Um, that's interesting. So moving on, we wanted to try some more advanced models. Uh, so we tried a random forest model and actually it was able with about 81% accuracy uh, to predict whether that corporate militia came from a case or a control. So that was a little more promising for us. Um, and we were also able to calculate the feature importance of this model um, using this mean decrease in impurity. Uh, so what we got was very similar to the logistic regression model. Um, with percent area occupied being the strongest predictor, and then circularity being the second, and nearest neighbor and area not being very important uh, to the random forest. So 
since around 60% of the corporate analytics came from AD, so we didn't have a completely balanced data set, which can be an issue with these models because there's some sort of bias because if you have more of one and less of the other, the algorithm can kind of pick the one that has more um, and try to, to guess that way. So what we did was we created a dummy classifier, um, which essentially, you can scroll down just a little bit. So our, our dummy classifier uh, used this strategy called most frequent. So it took into account how many uh, cases versus control uh, examples we had, uh, and it predicted that way. And it got about 62, but later on the, the accuracy score is not as important. Um, really the ROC curve is, is the most important. So the ROC curve, as we saw in the previous um, presentations, and it plots the true positive versus the false positive. Uh, and essentially what we need to see here is the larger the area under the curve, the more accurate and the better the model is at um, successfully predicting uh, whether these came from either a case or a control. So as we can see here, the dummy classifier, uh, a straight line is basically 50-50. You're flipping a coin, case, control, see what happens. Um, the K nearest neighbor did a little bit better, uh, but not much. And then logistic regression did a little bit better than those. Um, and then finally, our random force was actually decently successful um, at, at guessing whether the program was a case or a control. Um, and what we want to do to further expand on this is uh, do a, a stratified table with cross validation, like uh, our, uh, we saw in the previous presentation, uh, just to see over an average of multiple iterations how does the model do. Um, but really the most important thing that we got out of this was we learned that the percent area occupied and the circularity are the heaviest weighted features um, and this is great because now we know out of all the features that we tested uh, those are the most important ones and we, this suggests that they're the strongest associated with, with AD status so this has been a great experience uh, these analysis have really deepened my understanding of how program Malaysia interact uh, in the disease state and how they um, are play a role in the pathogenesis. And actually what we're doing is we're taking these ideas that we, we learned here and implementing them into my thesis project. So, so far it's been, it's been a great experience. Um, also, we wanna to plan to scale this up. So we're actually working on increasing our data set. And there's a lot of processing that goes behind the scenes. It's a lot of work. Uh, but if we can get 60 plus brains, uh, that would probably be around 15, 16,000 data points as far as individuals, uh, individual co And that might clean up the picture a little bit and give us some better separation uh, with our unsupervised learning. So overall, this was, has been such a great experience. Um, I'd like to thank IDSC, all of you, uh, as well as my mentors, Dr. Ogihara and his PhD student, uh, Jerry Bono, who was extremely helpful as well. Uh, of course, my mentor, Dr. William Scott, has, has been here the whole way and helping out. And yeah, it's just been a great experience. So, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I've got another question with the like, uh, getting the data. I'm actually curious. How did you uh, quantify all the data? Have like software that would quantify all these features for you, or how? Yeah. Doing? So. So what we did was, so we have these massive image data and we prop out kind of the section that we're interested in. So we take a big prop of the CA1 and the CA3. Um, and then what I did actually was using a color thresholding method. I was able to get rid of all the noise and only isolate the features I was interested in. So you saw in the picture, uh, the corporate emulation actually stained pink. So they were just very bright pink. So that made it really easy to kind of just say, anything that's not pink, get rid of it. I just want a binary you know, pink or nothing else. Um, so, so that was the first step. And then using an image J, it's a software, you're able to, it's able to you know, calculate, automatically. automatically detect them, and then it'll give you uh, circularity, all the metrics that we used. Uh, except for nearest neighbor, that was a separate thing, but, but yeah, essentially through image J and, and color thresholding, so, so you pick the sample or you pick the or to measure everything, right? Uh, everything in that area, yeah. Everything, but you, you know, is it all GAs or just 
All CA. Oh, yeah, all CA. And so out of the huge hippocampal section, it cropped out one area of the hippocampus. Uh, it's still a big area. But then how did you select? So that was manual? No, that was manually. Um, because the hippocampus is this strange formation, you actually need uh, somebody trained in neuropathology to say, okay, this is the CA1 area. We're going to okay. crop this out. But you pick the whole CA1 area. Exactly. So okay. instead of some people, uh, in some pathology papers, they'll take multiple sections and then. Right, that's what I was saying. But what I did, I just I took the whole CA1 area. Uh, that way I didn't have to uh, worry about sampling bias. Right, that's what I was getting. Exactly. You exactly. took the whole, whole thing for the whole thing, like whatever you could. Exactly. You know, and that helped. Yeah. Help. Yeah, and that helps exactly with the bias. And, uh, right, so. Because, yeah, the other way is to get something like right? exactly. extrapolate. Uh, yeah, and could, with the th color threshold, it was easy enough to just say, take you know all of the CA in this giant area and calculate those. So, so because yeah. in many of these problems, right, and everybody would talk about it, yeah. all the machine learning models, including, you know, supermicro or unsupermicro problems, right? So, so the data kind of, you know, the uh, how hard get the data, how we transform the data. Exactly. So what is actually the whole art you work? Yeah. The other stuff, you know, you can you can figure it out, figure it, but how you do this, you can actually determine your outcome. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I can add bias and uh, add biases and also how you transform the data is very I mean yeah. with images it's not that, that big deal, right? So because you get yeah. you know, yeah. pixels. But when you have to transform the data, yeah. the way that you transform the data is actually the one of the most important parts yeah. of what you're doing. That's why you can see a lot of machine learning techniques. You can use images and so forth, which is right, because you don't have to transform the data. Okay. So the data is already you know, yeah. in a vectorized form and so forth. But when you have to transform the data, this is where things are becoming a lot more complicated. Exactly. Yeah. And these uh, methods are very sensitive to that. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that's, I mean, the majority of the time spent on this project was that. You know, the modeling is a couple lines of code, it's pretty easy, but Transforming, organizing, shifting, extracting, and that, that's really the majority of data science projects. Yeah. That's the first part. So, yeah. how many individuals do you guys have? So, for each subject, there, there were 15 total, nine uh, in Alzheimer's and four controls. Uh, and for each one, there were two sections of the hippocampus, so the CA1 and the CA3. Um, and then what do you mean for how many images? So, and then the data was extracted from the images. Yeah, I didn't see the computer images. You, you had the, uh, the accuracy. Yeah, I just had, I was printing the accuracy, and then at the end, I was using the ROC curve to get the, the total, like 30 individuals. Oh, no. Um, the 3,000 individual for granulation were input into the model. So, so, yeah. So, out of all, yeah, so it was. You have the image and then you extract it. So here you can see just an example of just a small area. There's hundreds of them. So we took actually uh, on a core granulation level, on an individual level, the data. So and that was put into the model. So a total of around 3,000. Great. Great job. Yeah, thank you. No. We have. Clappings and thumbs up for okay, everybody. That's good. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> Bye. Well, okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here today and for our fellows for this great year and their results. They all look very promising. So you can continue your research and anything that you need in the future, just let us know. And thank you, everybody who was on Zoom joining us today. Have a great evening. Thank you all.